welcome to the 20th edition of the India Business Leader Awards. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're coming to you live from Mumbai where we've just concluded the deliberations of the India Business Leader Awards. The jury just met. We have arrived at a great set of winners, but you will have to wait till the 7th of December to find out who walks away with the coveted honors. Uh, it has been an absolute privilege to have these esteemed guests with us here. The India Business Leader Awards jury headed by Mr. Baba Kalyani. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalyani, for joining us here. And as always, Arin Daruwala, part of the IBLA jury. Also, Ashok Vasfani of Kotak Mahindra Bank, Kartik Reddy of Bloom Ventures, Mr. Shankar Raman of LNT, Kunal Behel of Snapdeal, Amit Singhal of Asian Paint, Sunita Reddy of Apollo Hospitals, and Ravi Kumar of Cognizant, uh, making up the jury along with uh, Mr. KVS Manian of Federal Bank and CS Seti of State Bank of India. Uh, and as I pointed out, we do have an illustrious list of winners. But what we are here today to do is to discuss what India and India's growth story could potentially look like over the next 25 years. Why 25? And it's important to note because CNBC TV 18 turns 25 this year. We marked a very significant milestone and so we're now forecasting what could be the India growth story over the next 25 years. Without further ado, let me start with the jury chair, Mr. Kalyani. Many thanks for joining us again. As I pointed out, you've uh, been in business now for over 50 years steering Bharat Forge. You've seen the many changes in the evolution of the Indian economy, especially India post-liberalization. If you were to put your money on one single theme over the next 25 years that you believe could be the multi-bagger for India, what would it be? The one single theme that I believe in is the talent that India has, especially in its youth. <clears throat> that is going to change India's trajectory in the next 25 years. As you are beginning to see so many things happening in the startup world, you know, people like us are now antiques. So, good antiques. <laughs> well, good or bad, we will know. But I think it's really good to see so many youngsters who are able to do some wonderful things in this country. And I think the game has just started. Hmm. You know, you, you talked about talent and you believe that the game, in your words, has just started. But one of the challenges, and that is a challenge that we need to contend with, not just in the near term, but over the next 25 years, will be the jobs challenge. We keep talking about the demographic dividend and the demographic advantage, but to deliver on the kinds of jobs, the quality of jobs, the number of jobs, especially in an era where people are talking about AI being the big disruptor, how do you today, as a business leader, see that? You know, you can, you can divide jobs into multiple categories. So I'll speak about manufacturing, because I think a lot of jobs are going to get created in the manufacturing sector, of course, the service sector, the fin financial sector. But if you look at manufacturing, today, manufacturing sector is roughly about $600 billion in our economy. It's roughly about 15% of our GDP. Now, if we believe that our economy is going to be anywhere between 25 to 35 trillion dollars in the next 25 years, that's what everybody is talking about. Mm. Mr. K. V. Kamat just last week talked about, you know, the possibility of us reaching a 50 trillion dollar yeah. economy. So, and the manufacturing sector coming anywhere between 20 to 25 percent of the economy. You're looking at a manufacturing sector which is going to be 10x of what it is today, and we are already beginning to feel the surge. Although there are a lot of, uh, let's say, headwinds in terms of uh, the geopolitical tensions that are taking place, uh, the entire Middle East war, the non-ending Russia-Ukraine war, uh, and of course the new China versus the rest of the world uh, campaign that has started. But this puts India in a, in a very good spot. If we can get things right in the next five to seven years, Nobody is going to stop India. You know, I'm going to get to what you believe we need to get right so that India is unstoppable. But in, uh, in just a second, Zareen, let me come to you now. Let's start by talking about the evolution that we've seen as far as India's banking and financial sector is concerned. And more importantly, from where we're poised today to actually be able to fuel the growth, to fuel the aspiration, what more you believe needs to be done for the next 25 yeah. So I think first, before uh, I get into the banking sector, I think we should look at uh, what has happened to India 60, 16, and 6, I would say. It took 60 years for us to reach 1 trillion. 
16 years later to reach uh, 3.5 trillion and then 6 years to reach 6.4 trillion. And between 1999 and 2009, India's GDP grew 3x, from 450 billion to 1.35 trillion. So in three, one decade, we grew 3x. And if we look at that, and one of the reasons was that uh, rupee dollar depreciation didn't happen much in that period. Mm. So if you were to assume that rupee will be reasonably stable, we are actually looking at some real big numbers like Mr. Kamat talked of. So I think banking sector, clearly, uh, we've seen a dramatic change in the last um, uh, two decades. And I joined at a time where there was no debit card, no credit card, no ATM. <laughs> and now no there's only UPI. <laughs> no internet, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, now you have UPI and, uh, I mean, the whole way the digital disruption is happening. But I think uh, the banking sector, last few years, if you look at the resilience that we've seen in the banking sector and the way the whole NPA story is played out thanks to the IBC code, and also the resilience in terms of whether it's cyber security or whether it, you look at any other parameters, the banking sector has shown real resilience and has obviously been a big contributor to the growth. I think going forward, again, banking sector will be sort of a big uh, multiplier effect. Normally, banking sector grows two times the GDP uh, rate. So actually, we will see credit growing at 15% for next few years. And obviously banking sector doing its bit for the capex the infra spends etc so so let me let me uh, uh, pick up on what mr kalyani said to truly ensure that india is unstoppable the one thing that you would like either the government or the private sector to focus on i would say that uh, the whole digital thing and the whole I, the services sector two things that have really played out very well for india if you look at the digitization, it has democratized everything, whether it's financial services or anything, it has democratized. And digital being a way of bridging the gap, to my mind, that should continue. And it is obviously, uh, whether it's UPI or anything, it has really helped to digit, sort of democratize. Uh, and the way the services sector has mm. grown, I mean, we are now 4.2% of the uh, ex, uh, global services exports, which was 2% maybe a few years back. And if India becomes like 6, 7, 8% of the uh, global services exports, it sort of lends a huge stability to the rupee dollar uh, that we've seen sharp depreciation in the last few years. I think that really will sort of play so out the, the well. Twin, the twin engines, the services engine as well as the manufacturing engine, hopefully uh, to fire at the same time and continue to fire parallelly could deliver on that growth aspiration that we're talking about. Mr. Shankar Raman, uh, the infrastructure aspiration, I mean, you know, across cities at this point in time, we are seeing uh, infrastructure being built out. The government has, of course, been front-loading CapEx, and we've seen the benefits of that play out over the last few years, especially in a post-COVID era. But let's talk about the next 20 and how do you see the India infra story playing out? I think for India to be competitive, it's very important that the infrastructure is built in a competitive fashion. When I talk about competitiveness, it's not the lowest costing infrastructure, but the quality of the infrastructure, the life cycle cost of infrastructure has to be kept in view. Uh, I don't think as a country we have yet uh, given enough importance to quality. Uh, the, the, because resources are scarce, I think we tend to go with uh, the choices which cost the pocket the less, least. Uh, but I think a time has come when India wants... Is to it a resource issue or is it a mindset issue? This L1 issue is, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily boil down to just a resource issue anymore. No, I think it's just a question of uh, uh, getting work done at the, within the budget. And the practicality of drawing the budgets the way our systems are is that you need to be prudent. Now, being a, a country which is actually just about trying to get out of poverty, I think it's a good idea to be prudent. But prudent at what cost is something to be done. According to me, I think the infrastructure that I visualize is something that is going to be useful for the masses. And unless it is useful for the masses, the, the owners of the infrastructure can't even monetize it. Mm. I think the way the, the sponsors of infrastructure should look at infrastructure is not 
it's built to last for sure, but built to monetize as well. Mm. Because the capital churn is going to be important. It's not going to be possible for us to keep borrowing on a certain balance sheet and keep building the infrastructure of the kind that we require. So my own sense is I think if we are able to get the life cycle cost of infrastructure down, manufacturing will benefit because the unit cost of production will come down and it will help us to connect globally, whether it's import or exports. So to my mind, I think quality infrastructure built competitively is the way I would like to look at infrastructure. And as far as the monetization issue is concerned, because this has been, uh, you know, a complex and a vexed problem in India. We've seen it play off or play out in some sectors successfully, but not so much in other sectors. The one thing that you would like to see being done differently to ensure that we do see a pipeline for asset monetization. I think if you're able to crash the time that we are losing in building infrastructure, I think it will help the present value of uh, money being unlocked. Today we take at least two, two and a half years more than the scheduled time to complete infrastructure for a variety of reasons. If you're able to crash that, not only will you get time in your favor, but you'll also get the cost down. And minute the cost comes down, it becomes more interesting for the next set of investors who want to come in. So I think what we need to focus on is good quality in good time. Good quality in good time. Sunita Reddy, let me come to you now. The next 25, we've talked about manufacturing services, uh, infrastructure, and of course, uh, health of the nation, which uh, will really be the backbone and the bedrock of delivering on each of these promises. So definitely we need more investment in healthcare. And I keep saying that over and over again. The reason is that, you know, we know the size of our population. The disease burden could be up to $3 trillion by 2035 if we don't do it now. So there is a huge urgency in building out infrastructure, second access through insurance, which, which is happening, but you know, so much more that can be done. The third is to really is to look at the quality of life because while we have mental health on one side, you have aging people on the other side. So the quality of life is very important, not just life expectancy. And um, as we look at this, you know, preventive health care will play a huge role in keeping he people healthy. Uh, when we, in 1970, people, you know, would, the expectancy, life expectancy was at 58. Today it is at 68. In 25 years later, you can expect it to be 87. So we have a huge job of, uh, ahead of us keeping people healthy. And I think that uh, we should be proud as a nation that 80% of the people in India used to go abroad for health care. Now we have people from 150 countries coming to India. So a huge opportunity to be relevant, not just for India, but for the world. Not just relevant for India, but for the world. That could be the, the uh, healthcare model going forward. But Sunita, you know, just to talk about India's own problems and delivering good quality healthcare for all Indians, as you pointed out, life expectancy expected to uh, go up significantly over the next 25 years. Who's going to fund this? Because the government does have limited resources and every budget we know that the ask is more. But, you know, in terms of private capital, we've now got the, the uh, private equity guys coming into the healthcare sector in a big way. But there are also concerns on what that will mean in terms of access to a good quality healthcare for the average Indian. So who's going to fund the healthcare story going forward? I think it has to be a combination of PPP, you know, public sector, private sector, Depends on locations, but we've seen many states come forward with subsidies to set up hospitals. And uh, healthcare will get will need to get more localized if it is to be at the right price. The second is the use of the transformation that has happened in telehealth, the transformation that has happened in AI, where people can, which we're using keep, to keep people healthy, and all of this coming together the convergence of technology, the convergence of, uh, you know, of getting qualified doctors, skilling programs, and government prepared to partner with the private sector. Well, you know, talking about evolution and change, Ravi, let me come to you because the Indian software export story has been one that has matured and evolved over the past four decades here in India. What do you see as the next wave uh, for this, this industry, for this export-oriented industry that has generated not just wealth but employment opportunities, especially in an AI era? Absolutely. So, Srin, uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would say for the last, uh, you know, three or four decades, um, tech services and outsourcing 
human capital for tech services was the foundation for the services sector and the exports of services sector. Uh, as tech has actually become core for enterprises, I mean outsourcing happened when tech was non-core. As tech has gone core for enterprises, you would actually see enterprises, global 2000 and Fortune 500 companies setting up their own shop in India, um, which in some sense is a very healthy mix of services. There is already one third of the five million ID professionals work for global capability centers. Yeah. There are 2,000 of them. Uh, almost uh, 300 to 400 of them actually got set in the last two years. So that you're going to see one, one switch of that, a more diverse uh, services sector. Equally, technology is intertwined into engineering, R&D, and operations of enterprises. So you're going to see a variety of uh, things happening, all the way from operations to engineering services, to tech services. So India is actually going to be the office of the world mm. in the next 25 years for sure. It's going to service the entire spectrum. Now, connecting to the AI topic, which you just said, AI is probably one of the biggest disruptions we're going to see in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it will take away jobs of the past. It will create significantly more jobs of the future. Every tech disruption came with a S curve. This is going to be a very sharp S curve. It's going to be a slow takeoff, but a very, sh very short runway. And the reason is, so far, in all the tech disruptions, humans wanted to understand machines. This is the first time machines are going to understand humans. The interface is natural language. Mm. If the interface is natural language, the diffusion is going to be very fast. Mm. Software which is built in the Silicon Valley will get diffused to rural India, a farmer in rural India, with the, with, the natu with the natural language, a dialect which is very vernacular, can actually access it. So it is going to be a leveler of sorts. Mm. I've actually mentioned this before. It's a leveler because you don't need skills to access the technology. You want to have expertise on your fingertips, which means the jobs which will come in the future the occupations, between occupations, the gap will bridge, and within occupations, the gap will bridge. Because you can actually lend expertise. Like in the mobile revolution, we lend information, we're going to lend expertise. Which means the entry barriers for jobs will go down. Which means the access to jobs, the digital divide which happened because of skills, will actually be gone. So I would actually believe we're going to actually go to a more shared prosperity, mm. and a very upward mobile society, okay. where access to good jobs, is not going to be actually restricted by education, but actually be powered by skills and powered by uh, the extraordinary entrepreneurial spirit of the company and the, of the of the country. So you, you know, said it'll be slow to take off, but the runway is going to be shorter. When do we expect? When should we expect the real takeoff? I think uh, you know if I if I look at it, the foundation models which everybody is talking about so far is going to get very quickly commoditized. Applications on top of the foundation model are actually going to be the power of it. And as entrepreneurs start to build uh, applications on it, you're going to see uh, the takeoff much faster. India has 120,000 odd startups. Only 35,000 work in technology. Around 3,000 have deep tech and they work on new age technologies like AI. So you're going to see a lot more embrace of that over the startup ecosystem. More applications are going to be built, and uh, it'll be, uh, it will take off as we, it'll be a hockey stick, if I may. And the data, the, the digital data of this country, the micro level data which is available in mm. India, this, the India stack, which has population grid data, will support the, uh, the uh, I would say, the, catali the catalyzation of uh, these applications. Well, you know, since we're talking about hockey sticks and S-curves, uh, Amit, uh, let, let's talk about the consumption curve and the consumption engine as well, because the expectation is as we double the per capita, that is going to unlock uh, the consumption engine, and we are probably on the cusp of a decadal run as far as consumption is concerned. How do you look at this and the potential and the opportunities it throws up? So actually, as you look at it, I feel that as you kind of uh, look at the next uh, 25 odd years, uh, there will be disruption in terms of how you look at a correlation with the GDP. 
I feel that uh, whether it is uh, the housing sector in terms of the way it is coming or it is the consumption patterns uh, of consumer segmentation which conventionally companies think of, all that is going to go through a little bit of a disruption as I see it because no longer today we see the same consumer segmentation today apply in terms of how companies look at defining their target consumer. You look at the uh, middle class which possibly is bulging in all directions in terms of going forward today, in terms of really there is more earning power which is coming and therefore today if you look at the consumption story it is going both upwards as well as uh, you know spreading and making the pyramid broader in terms of going forward. So as we see I think uh, the consumption story is so going to be pretty big in terms of how it is kind of dwelling not only from the point of view of even essential housing coming up to that extent but also from the point of view of people looking at uh, second housing and third housing which the way it is kind of developing to that extent. So I feel that uh, going forward a lot also depends in terms of the way uh, you know the infrastructure is getting built up because that will play a pivotal role in terms of how some of these uh, areas will expand as we look at into future because today I think uh, one of the big pains in terms of uh, larger consumption expansion also happens in terms of from a point of view of good governance. Mm. Going forward I think uh, that will also play a very pivotal role in terms of how that leads how it is a style of uh, more getting inclusivity in terms of the whole area of working which will fuel the consumption in terms of going forward. Okay, so uh, talking about fueling consumption, Mr. Vaswani, uh, let's address uh, the kind of growth that you believe India is poised for. I know you're a big believer in the digital stack and you believe that that, uh, as Arine was pointing out, has really given wings, uh, you know, and we're seeing that play out even in terms of credit growth for banks, etc. But the next 25, what does the vision board for you look like? So, I, look, I think digital is just one element of the whole thing. It really comes down to uh, the basic aspects of confidence linked with ambition. If confidence links with ambition, you will get dramatic growth. And I think that's what we've seen in India, but I really think it's the beginning. We've, the India today is far more confident than India has ever been. That linked with ambition and setting the mindset where you think about the global stage as opposed to the local stage, will just take us to a completely different level. Mm. So for me, it's the human element of uh, confidence linked with ambition. So you're on, on Mr. Kalyani's side that is going to really be the entrepreneurial spirit as well as the, the talent that will drive the kind of uh, growth that we're hoping for. Ultimately, it's all about people. It is all about people. Kartik, uh, let me come to you. Uh, if, if you had to uh, uh, offer the Indus Valley report, which you do, uh, uh, what, what could the next 25 years potentially look like? What would your best thesis be? I think there's, uh, the, the way uh, we look at it from startup land is, one, the fact that you're going to add multiple, multiples of the current India in terms of output and economic output, it's just fascinating because it's all available for someone new to disrupt, right? So firstly, to be able to talk about, I mean, there are traditional business giants on the stage here, uh, but incremental growth to a new set of audiences is all up for the taking. So I think every sector, especially if it's riding on uh, digital mobility, healthcare, education, there's so many areas of potential disruption and way business models are delivered, unlike they were, unlike how they were delivered before. So, you know, I was joking with somebody, even in, even the, the country has become so aspirational that even roti kapda makan is being rewritten, right? So it is not about basic essential, but it's what it's aspirational to the next hundreds of millions of people. So I would say somewhere 10 years down the line, you would write an entire set of new consumer brands that have driven on this roti kapda makan equivalent. But I feel to, if you want to really uplift 1.5 billion growing at like a crazy pace, the most populous nation in the world, I think the ability to plan like infrastructure, just not connect, just not building on existing infrastructure, but actually building new towns and cities, mobility to get in and out, right? And then actually provide healthcare, education, financial services at a pace mm -hmm. where these people couldn't access it before. Financial services is the fastest because it's yeah. all digital. But you can't digitize everything around education and healthcare. And our belief is that unless you, it, I mean, I, I say it partly in jest, but partly in seriousness, that you almost have to, you know, conscript people into K-12. 
right? If the government had money to spend, you almost have to put kids through phenomenal primary schooling if you really want to take the potential of this country and export it to the world. That's the power we have. We have a demographic dividend. My fear is we lose it in 20 years if we take two, three, five, seven, ten years to keep evolving on that front. Because with each set of people who graduate out of 10th grade, mm. the opportunity set goes lower if you've not actually brought them to world-class talent levels. Mm. So I would say that... What's in, the fix? What's the, the fix? fix? I'm telling you, literally, I think every state government, I mean, we compete for ease of doing business and things like that. I think the state government should be pushed to actually take their education levels to a notch higher and put a significant amount of their tax dollars they collect at the state level into education. I think everything else gets solved on the basis of this talent pool, which is relatively small compared to the opportunity set that India provides uh, to explore them. Then manufacturing, mm. infrastructure, tech, our ability to build great products that service the world, just explored. And I think we are at a vantage position today to be able to deliver for the entire planet, right? Uh, and whether it's language or whether it's demographics, we have a lot of advantages on our end. I don't think we are poised to plan and deliver on that fast enough if we don't make those changes in the next five to ten years. Well, Kunal, to, you know, to pick up on what Karthik said, how we're poised today, where we're poised today, and more importantly, the changes that we need to bring about to ensure that we truly realize our full potential. You know, Shireen, um, often asked this question about what are the industries that the startups will impact right, in the, in the next 10 years, 25 years in India. And actually, the way I think about it is, which are the industries they will not impact, mm. right? They will impact every possible industry. Um, and there are largely a few reasons for it, right? One is we are adding this half a trillion of GDP a year. Uh, Karthik, as Karthik said, like, that's all up for grabs from traditional as well as new companies. We have a government policy which is highly favorable and celebratory about for startups. We have digitization that probably a, no country outside of China has ever seen. Um, we have domestic capital, which is now increasing. Last year, only 15% of Indian startups were funded by domestic capital, but it's on the rise. And finally, we have talent, right? mm. 28 years, median age, and you know, millions of graduates every year. So we're, we're going to be, we are and we are going to be a talent-dense country. I feel we are well set. I think this, uh, we are, the, the rocket has left the station uh, and, and we, it's going to land, land on its destination. I actually have a prediction. I think you're looking for predictions. Yes, thought, that's exactly what I'm looking I, for. I was thinking that we should end with a prediction. <laughs> I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about new age IPOs and, and yeah. I feel that, I think all of us feel that in the end, that's the true testament of enduring, lasting enduring companies uh, for the most part. And today we may have 25 new age companies that have listed. I feel next 25 years we'll have 2,500 uh, new age companies that will be listed and will be lasting enduring companies. Okay, that's the, the prediction that's come in there from Kunal Behel. 2,500 new age companies likely to be listed uh, on the Indian stock markets over the next 25 years and that certainly uh, you know, will go a long way in not just legitimizing the startup story uh, but also uh, allowing retail investors to actually participate in that startup story as well and of course create opportunities and employment. But Mr. Kalyani, you know, I want to come back to you now uh, and pick up on Kunal and, and get you to leave us with a prediction as well on manufacturing. You know, this 25% and we're still not there. We're not even close to it today, sir. We're still stuck in that band. Uh, when do you believe we're going to be able to achieve that 25% share of GDP for manufacturing? You know, when Manmohan Singh was Prime Minister, he said this goal. 25% of GDP needs to be manufactured. That was like 15 years ago. Yes. And we haven't moved even one degree from where we were. The issue is very simple. India has never believed in an innovation-driven economy. We have always believed that if we need something that's not made here, we have to go out and get it. The problem is, in the next two, three years, there is nobody out there who's going to make things. <coughs> the Germans are losing out. They don't have people to work. They are now getting 5,000 people from Maharashtra, engineers, to go and work there. The same thing is happening in the United States. The UK is already gone. So there is just no place except China to get things. And what uh, he was talking about, the whole spectrum is open. We look at medical equipment. What percentage of medical equipment do we make in India? Mm. Less than 10%. Mm. And we're talking about 
taking care of some 1.5 billion people in the next 25 years, getting their health mm. in proper shape, you're going to require so much more of all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, you talked about funding. I don't think funding is ever going to be a problem. If we believe our GDP is going to go from 3.8 of you know 3.9 trillion to 25 or whatever that number is, just the GST that is going to come out of incremental output, you know, will finance all these things yeah. multiple times. The issue is India needs to become a product comp product driven country, not a service driven country. Hmm. We can't just have global engineering centers sitting here and Indians working in global engineering centers and creating products for them, you know, somewhere else. Mm. We need to start making our own products. If we don't become a product-driven mm. country, this is not going to happen. But the onus is then on the private sector it's, to do it, yeah, isn't sure. it? Sure, we are doing it and it will happen. I'm, I, I can... I am very confident that it will happen because... Why, why do you believe... What has changed? What is the flip? The flip is... There are many people, you talked about young uh, people who are coming in the job market, Kunal talked about it. All these guys are technically qualified. And as Ravi said, the AI, the chat GPT, whatever is available, it makes knowledge available to everybody mm. on their fingertips. And it's unbelievable, you know, if somebody wants to give a speech at a particular session, Earlier, you had to spend three days in, you know, <laughs> figuring out and writing down your own speech. Now you can do it in about 10 minutes. Yes. So, so it's, it's a big difference. And I think what is missing in India is we have to become a product-driven country. And why we are not a product-driven country is because the system doesn't trust you. And we have to build that trust by making sure you have products. Why does the system trust ISRO? Because ISRO has been successful in landing, mm. uh, you know, something on the moon. Yeah. Now, if it, if it was not successful, they wouldn't even trust them. Mm. Why do they trust our nuclear corporation? Because they are able to build reactors at, what, one-third the price. I mean, you would know much more about it. Yeah. So, you know, there is, there is a whole range of products that are going to come, and we just need to make products. We can't just make services. That's not going to work. You know, Karthik, let's pick up on that and I'll get everyone to comment on this. This transition from being a startup nation to a product nation, and it's not necessarily an easy no, transition to it make. Is, it is not in conflict. No, it's not, it's not in conflict, but it's not an easy transition to make. You know, do you believe that we're on the cusp of being able to make that switch? It's slow, but it's happening. So I was just remarking to one of our the jury panelists, jury uh, panel, that we for the first time saw like a warehouse automation company power American warehouses. We saw a carbon capture company power European plants. Sadly, when they were looking for money for the first half of the last decade, after Bloom, nobody gave them money <laughs> in India. So I think it's a it's a twin problem. One is self-confidence to be able to say we can go and build against world-class companies on any product. Mm. And bizarrely, both these companies were college grads who had never worked a day in their life. So it took them twice as long to prove themselves as managers and leaders and yeah. go and raise in the rest of the world. So I think there is a slew of, you know, five-axis CNC machines, which are one-third the cost of German and Japanese machines being made in Pena and Bangalore in another startup. So if the, the number that, if you look at all our portfolios mm -hmm. now, I think we're very proudly not just building, you know, everything from, from two-wheeler, three-wheeler indigenously in electric vehicles to not just the big bajajas and the uh, yeah. heroes of the world. Yeah. We have indigenous you know, homegrown brands. So everything from building vehicles, I mm. hope the medical systems come, but, you know, rockets, as we saw earlier yeah. today, uh, to, you know, carbon capture plants, to industrial, you know, automation. That confidence and role modeling was what was missing, I mm. think. And we're beginning to see the first signs of it. So just as we thought IT services was a myth, 1988, mm. and then we saw the biggest companies of, in the world get built out of India. It's just a matter of time before we see the first deep tech startups and the life sciences startups. We also commented today that we don't build enough original pharmaceutical in life. It's not like we haven't tried, but I think when they failed, we lost confidence, 
And now is not a time to be underconfident on anything in India, is my view. It's now the time to go and win every sector because, as Mr. Kalyani said, it's the opportunity of a lifetime that the country has when every other country is shrinking in terms of talent, population. Mm. Cost structures, we just have an enormous advantage. The ISROs of the world are the pioneers, but yeah. there are hundreds of such examples. I think our time is coming on it, all of those fronts. Our, our time is coming or our time is here, Mr. Shankar Raman. You know, this winning mindset uh, that, uh, that everyone's talking about and making this transition now to being an innovative uh, or an innovation-driven country to a product-driven uh, uh, country. You know, uh, from your perspective, what are the things you believe that from a policy perspective uh, we need to change? And also, what are the things that the private sector needs to change in order for us to actually move up the innovation quotient? I think very simply put, um, the policy stress on R&D needs to go up. And this is across the board. Uh, we tend to be extremely good in uh, adapting to technology and doing the engineering thereafter. Uh, homegrown R&D requires support and policy enablement. Second is, I think, uh, since uh, the world is demonstrating the use of technology developed by, I mean, the, the software technology developed by Indians, I think time has come where we seriously look at productivity uh, in a holistic way. Um, a, I think um, you could have today robots doing a lot more of physical work that people were doing and that actually releases a lot of bonded labor mm. because the human potential can be better used than just uh, you know, breaking your back trying to do hard physical work. So I think if it's a combination of uh, R&D uh, thrust with automation and exploiting the technology advantage that we have, yeah. I think we could build a far stronger India. An India which is relevant not only to the Indians but to the world. Well, speaking of uh, addressing global challenges in Zareen, let's talk about the big challenge that we're all sort of uh, facing today, climate. You know, climate financing is going to be a big issue, and that is something that Indian companies will have to deal with, the Indian government will have to deal with. You know, on some of these sort of large issues, large challenges, how ready and prepared is the system over the next 25 years? Yeah, I think um, for India, it will be growth and green growth. So for India, it will be, we have to invest in normal growth and green growth. And uh, the estimate is that over the next 10 years, we'll have to invest a trillion dollars for the green part alone. And um, given the fact that, you know, private sector CAPEX anyway is sort of not moved up as much as we would like to see, I think the challenge will come is that... Uh, does India have enough resources for green growth? Uh, and it's very important that India supplements the local resources with dollar resources mm -hmm. because the global dollar bond market, if you see, India has only 1% share in the green bond today. And there's scope to certainly take more of the global pools of capital which is available, whether it's debt or equity. Even on the equity green, the kind of pools of capital that is available, India is still getting a very small share. And to make uh, sort of green uh, development attractive, I think we'll need some uh, sort of um, incentives, uh, whether from the government or the regulator. So, for example, if you look at Bank of Japan, they give one year interest-free loans if it's green. So different uh, regulators are giving different incentives, and obviously we've seen U.S., yeah. for example, the kind of uh, incentives they've rolled out for the green uh, part. I think India will need to step up so that the equity pools of money come because the, then the IRRs would become more attractive. Yeah, and I would imagine that those are going to be challenges that the regulator and the government uh, uh, contend with sooner rather than later. But, you know, I want to talk about growth from the prism of each of your individual businesses. And Sunita, let's, let's start by uh, talking to you about the aspiration that you have for the next 25 years as far as Apollo Hospitals is concerned, given the kind of opportunities that you see, not just in India, but to service the world. I mean, what, what should we expect from you, for instance? I think a lot of innovation. And uh, innovation is, is, is key. India invests 0.7% of GDP in research. But at Apollo, we're continuously investing in research. And what we've seen is that, you know, we're able to deliver healthcare, great quality healthcare, at one-tenth of the cost. We are now working with IIT to see that if we could do the same thing to medical manufacturing, 
to make sure that, you know, Tire 2 and Tire 3 can have the type of equipment that is life-saving and, you know, gives you the right diagnosis. But most important, it's the networks of care that we're building, which is changing formats. We have big investments required in infrastructure, but we're looking at, we're looking at primary health care, secondary, tertiary, building networks of care and connecting it to the digital. And that gives access to a larger population. And once you're digital, you know, you can take it across Southeast Asia. So my aspiration, and I think Apollo's aspiration, is to be relevant, at least in Southeast Asia where healthcare is concerned. We're already seeing patients from, from the West fly down to India because of shorter waiting times. Mm. So to be globally relevant, I think that we have everything that in our favor. And with the right amount of skilling and the use of AI, we should be able to really make sure that we do this at large scale. So an expanded global footprint by when? It's always changing, but I, like I said, with, uh, you know, with digital, it's, it's about the number of people. We're treating 200 million. Our goal is treat 400, 500 million people. Amit? At uh, Asian Paints, uh, you know, what is the, the growth aspiration that you've set out uh, for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And, and you know, uh, what's the assumptions that you're working with and what is that going to mean in terms of uh, uh, CapEx? So I think uh, what is relevant uh, as we kind of look forward is one of the key points which was raised earlier was about the skilling. We th think that, you know, I think the big impediment to kind of growth would come in if the skilling is not something which is there. And that is something which we are also investing in a big way in terms of looking at skilling at all aspects which are go there, which will kind of look at uh, democratizing design far more even that AI would do to that extent in terms of going forward. So that would be a key imperative in terms of what we would look at. And not only that, we are looking at saying that how can be part of the consumer decor life cycle completely and it is not restricted to only one category but extends across categories so that you are able to cater to not only going to the bottom of the pyramid but also kind of traverse the entire pyramid in terms of the consumer journey going even up to the premium and the luxury end. So I think that's the way which we see in terms of how the overall housing design and decor will kind of go and we want to be part of every house as we go forward. So how many new ancillary businesses are you likely to get into? How many new niches are you likely to service outside of paints <laughs> so sky is the limit and i think uh Today, uh, we would like to be say that we are part of the share of the home as we kind of keep on going ahead. Share of the home, that could mean any, it could mean anything and everything, uh, uh, Amit. Uh, for Cognizant Ravi, what's the aspiration now over the next uh, 25 years? Uh, I know you want to be part of the winner's circle, uh, but you know, uh, take me through what, uh, what has been laid out now as you play the story. So, you know, uh, the way I would uh, present this, uh, Shareen, as uh, skilling has been spoken about, uh, I mean, uh, the industry of tech services has powered the technology human capital of the world. So the skilling of the future is going to be very different to skilling of the past. Working alongside machines, working alongside AI to amplify the human potential is a very different paradigm. Being lifelong learners is a very different paradigm. I think one of you spoke about K-12 schools and the education attached to K-12 schools. So just to take a, you know, a shot at what the industry should do, most of the AI value today is at the back end. It's with the infrastructure companies. It will move to the front end, and as it moves to the front end, I think um, Cognizant and the entire 5 million tech services ecosystem at, uh, in India has the unique opportunity to build applications and be the innovation capital of the world powered by AI. A new category of tech products, new, new category of software is going to be written, written by machines and humans together, amplifying each other. And in Science India. Science and technology are going to be intertwined. It never happened before. Science contributed to technology in a big way over the last 100 years. But technology is going to contribute back to science now. That's a flywheel we're going to see because technology is now going to, you know, unveil the, the protein predictions, uh, climate predictions. It's going to unveil uh, material sciences. The ability to bring science and technology together mm -hmm. in the age of AI is going to be a huge opportunity for India.
a huge opportunity for India. Uh, Mr. Shankaraman, your prediction now on the infrastructure side and uh, your prediction for uh, LNT over the next 25 years as well. Uh, I think over the next 25 years, we would like to demystify infrastructure because it is... We're still demystifying it. <laughs> yeah, because I think uh, many times uh, uh, ability to build uh, infrastructure gets pushed back by the mammoth effort that is involved. So I think it's important that this becomes, uh, LNT becomes not only a desirable partner to have, but also an affordable partner to have. So one of the things that we're working on, and I hope in the next 25 years, generations that would succeed me, uh, would work, continue to work on is to bring the break-even point of investing in infrastructure lower and lower without compromising on quality. If you're able to do that, then the sponsorship for infrastructure would go up dramatically. And as others have been saying, I think today for a good idea, well-implemented resources are not a constraint. It's just a question of having the mindset to put ideas to work and see through the implementation. So I would like infrastructure, the ones that we take five years to build, to be built in maybe next 25 years in uh, one third of the time. And what could the pipeline potentially for you look like if all goes as per plan? Well, if you're talking about we are sitting on, uh, as a company, uh, sitting on an order book of $60 billion, now they should go up if all this comes through by at least four times. Over the next 25 years? Yeah. Okay. Well, Mr. Baswani, the growth picture, the growth aspiration uh, that, uh, that you're working towards, I know, I know that uh, you have lofty plans as well, but uh, uh, you know, just, just convergence of what the bank's aspirations are with the economies. So look, I think over a longer period of time, financial services is going to change very, very dramatically. I mean, we've talked about it, if we just look back 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, the way we think of financial services today and the way we thought about it 25 years ago, completely different. And so that is going to happen. My firm belief is that banks at the end of the day are risk management companies. The one thing they don't want to do is manage risk. And we will become pure risk managers who use a lot of data and we will develop models which will help our customers, whether it's individuals or institutions, to manage financial risks. And the way we'll do it will be completely different from what we are doing today. How so? It's just, today there's a physicality of money. Today there are reservoirs and flows. It's not about the models. And henceforth, it's all going to be outsourcing those models. So think of financial services as, let's say, services as a software, mm. where we give away our risk models because we've got such sophisticated risk models that helps an individual customer to make a simple choice between buying a house, renting a house, or should I lease a factory, buy a factory, or should I exchange for an exchange today or tomorrow? And those kind of models is which will get developed at a hyper scale in a completely different way. Karthik, prediction time. Prediction is, I think, um, you know, I think we haven't yet built the $50 billion companies in India from the startup world. Uh, I would say in the next decade, we'll have at least uh, 10 of those, uh, probably $50, $5 billion plus companies, and probably $250 billion companies, all built venture funded from scratch, brand new entrepreneurship that all emerged from post-2008, 2010, when the venture capital industry sort of came to being. And for the first time, I'm hoping Kunal, me, we build a homegrown venture capital industry, which is equivalent to the best in the valley. And we haven't, we've, not that we've borrowed, all the talent is here, but we leaned on, you know, Absolutely. Silicon Valley capital and their models for a long time. And we are huge, uh, you know, proponents of the idea that we have our own sort of capital efficient model to build public companies earlier and earlier and then compound after that. So uh, just as a data point, Amazon was a $570 million IPO 20, 27 years ago. And so I think India is poised at that point today. So enough companies can go public at half a billion and less and then actually compound to become potentially 
a multi-hundred billion dollar company over the next 25 years. So I think we'll see our first multi-hundred billion dollar company in 25 years. And what I predicted for the next 10 years, I think will start accelerating and start happening in five-year cycles. So first multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred multi billion. Hundred billion dollar company in the next 25 years. That's the prediction that's coming from Karthik. I will leave the final word to the jury chair, Mr. Kalyani. Your big prediction for India and Bharat Forge. <laughs> I mean, India itself is going to grow from where we are today in the next 25 years, six to eight times as a country. The manufacturing sector is going to grow 10 to 12 times. I'm in the manufacturing sector, so I should at least grow at that level. So our prediction is that we should grow higher than what the country grows and what the country's manufacturing sector grows. The problem is you can't predict what products you're going to make five years from now, yeah. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. So you have to build enough capability mm. in terms of talent, in terms of R&D, in terms of whatever your core strengths are, like our core strength is metallurgy. And metallurgy is not restricted only to steel. Metallurgy is even in uh, making semiconductors. The yeah. paper is a metallurgical product. So. You know, it's all over the place. Yeah. So we are quite excited. We need to take cautious steps one at a time. We don't have deep pockets. We have enough pockets, but not <laughs> deep pockets. So I'm very optimistic. And I just want to, you know, what Zareen talked about, uh, the finances required for climate change. You know, this entire Europe created an ambience that you need hydrogen to make uh, green steel. And I hope you know that H2 steel in Sweden has failed, has gone bankrupt after spending 2 billion euros. Arsenal Mittal has uh, stopped their hydrogen usage in Germany. We are India's first green steel plant, a world's first green steel plant without using hydrogen. By using solar energy, biofuel and recycling. So let's not put all our eggs in no, one basket. I think in you, one basket. We need to learn to think differently. We need to learn to think the Indian way of doing things. I mean, recycling was the old way of doing things in India. I used to live in a village when I was young, till about six years old, and everything was recycled. And I think the modern way of recycling, we talked about it in our jury yes. discussions today, that's the way to go forward for India, and that is not expensive. That doesn't require trillions of dollars. Well, uh, there is, we, will, we will evolve the India playbook and the Indian playbook as well as we move to the future. But I think what is very evident and clear uh, from the conversation that we've had today, the opportunity is immense. Uh, the potential is immense. Of course, a lot needs to be done to realize that. But uh, uh, as, uh, as I just picked up here from, uh, from what our leaders have said, uh, you know, the story for India will not just be about protecting its past. It has to be about attacking the future, and that really will be the true test of India's leadership as well as the true test of the leaders here on this panel, protecting the past but attacking the future. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to wrap up the 20th edition of the India Business Leader Awards jury. We will be back again with the coveted winners on the 7th of December as we bring you the awards ceremony on CNBC TV 18 and also mark the 25th anniversary for CNBC TV 18 being India's number one business news channel. From all of us here for now, goodbye and many thanks for watching.